Why do you kids always say that? Huh? Your father said the same thing. And after all those games of cowboys and Indians, you get tired of make believe and you break your toys. Hello everyone, Jim Laskowski here with a very brief preamble since originally this was going to be a Patreon exclusive, but you know, this is a very special film for me. Uh, and also the Keith Gordon episode isn't coming for another few days and Bill Ackerman is hard at work on his uh, first contribution for Director's Club. But um, no, I had, to, I had to bring this up, that the fact that... This is a commentary that's dedicated to my dear old dad, who I know gets brought up a lot on the show, but for good reason. Honestly, Dabney Coleman here in Cloak and Dagger is as close to a portrayal of what he was like. Um, And I know he loved this movie just as much as I did. And of course, my guest, Eric Childress, is every bit as big of a fan as you'll hear. Uh, And I know having a Patreon means coming up with exclusive content But uh, for fans of the mid-80s, I don't know. If you grew up loving this movie, you'll want to hear this. I think it deserves um, a wide audience. And it's something you can either sync up uh, to watch along with us or simply just enjoy our conversation here uh, about Richard Franklin's cult classic, one of the best father-son stories of my lifetime, The Great Cloak and Dagger. Now on with the show and enjoy. Thank you so much, everyone. His game is make believe. Spying and sabotage. This is starting to get good. What? Just like cloak and dagger. Now any move could be his last. Trying to kill us. Come on, this is cloak and dagger. For real, it's what you always wanted. Cloak and dagger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special exclusive bonus episode which uh, reunites one of my favorite Chicago film critics, and of course, I'm your host, (laughs) Jim Laskowski, for a Director's Club feature-length movie commentary, which we haven't done in a a little while, although uh, fairly recently for episode 200, Patrick and I got together in person in my apartment and watched (laughs) Crash by David Cronenberg and Phantom Thread by Paul Thomas Anderson. We did two commentaries in a row, and the last one I did with this particular guest was on a special film from my childhood called The Last Starfighter. And uh, I think even at the time, that one received a well-deserved new Blu-ray, and I thought, well, since another childhood favorite of mine was recently put out by Vinegar Syndrome on a deluxe gorgeous 4k package why not invite him back since these two films we've done commentaries for happen to have a lot in common joining me once again the host of movie madness the co-host of friendship dilemma welcome back mr eric childress hello hello hey good to have you back (laughs) yes uh continuing our uh commentary run down the films of the summer of 1984 yeah we should just focus on uh other titles from that era um, when did Daryl come out? That was another I watched quite a it bit. Was, it was 84. It was? No, I'm sorry, that was 85. I'm sorry, oh, that was 85. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was one I think I watched a lot, even though I, I wouldn't put it on par with Last Starfighter, Cloak and Dagger, in terms of how much it means to me, uh, uh, personally, but... right. Yeah, so there's just a, you know there's certain movies from from that era I think I just watched just because they were on, <laughs> or I taped them and put him on a VHS tape and just watched it over and over again. Um, yeah, so, you know, we usually do a little preamble, but I think most of our thoughts on the film, Cloak and Dagger, of course, which is the film we're covering, um, they're going to come out organically throughout the commentary, I would think. So, I yeah, think... Yeah, and I, we I, can... I, I think, well, I'll just, I'll just say this, and some of this will, again, come out during the commentary to talk about that particular summer in general, but... 
you know, the, the film geekdom basically, you know, regards the summer of 1982 as like the, the pinnacle of like science fiction cinema, just like a, just a fantastic, so many memorable things that came out during that year, including a few movies on the same date. And, but I would, you know, I would say that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily put it down for a, a full showdown because I think 1982 would probably still win, but 1984 that summer, uh, I think has to be just as important and just as memorable for so many of us that regard 82 in the, in the same Mm -hmm. breath, because there's, there's a lot of stuff that came out during 1984 and that summer was a summer of movies for me. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I certainly have memories of seeing ghostbusters and gremlins in the theater Mm -hmm. and, this, the, yeah, this. I always sort of cite Back to the Future 1985 as being the epiphany, the big moment in my life where I said, okay, I'm just, I'm in, officially in love with movies. Uh, hmm. But I don't know. When I think back, I, obviously, th- this summer definitely made an impression. I will say, I don't know. I don't think I have saw Cloak and Dagger or The Last Starfighter in the theater when they officially came out. It was one of those things where uh, I saw them later on cable, or uh, my 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 sweet aunt <laughs> managed to get I don't even know how, but like a like bootleg copies on a VHS tape and gave it to me on my birthday. Of I believe it was Ghostbusters and Cloak and Dagger, or it might have been Last Starfighter and Cloak and Dagger. Like I I just have these vivid memories of. Oh my God! I got I own these now, and I don't even know how mm. she did it <laughs> at the time. But yeah, I yeah, uh, I did not I did not see either of these movies in the theater either, which right. is not for lack of effort. Um, I think I might I might have even mentioned it during the, our last Starfighter commentary about the trouble that I had seeing that movie that summer. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up here during the commentary too because it actually, funny enough, there's a strange one of those weird little geeky connections to a piece of this history that I have personally uh, that probably will interest you and me and nobody else. But, um, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. But um, I, I mean, I, I cloak and dagger seeing that movie for the first time, which I did not see in a theater is one of my favorite stories. And, and as far as like, like the opera, the, getting the opportunity to see that movie. Um, I mean, I could, tell it during the commentary but i could just tell it right here really quick this is probably probably better for those who don't want to hear me ramble on about it but it was there was a sleepover uh i I can't remember what i guess it was probably 85 maybe late 84 even Mm. um sleepover at friend's house uh you know a bunch of bunch of friends and whatnot and the dad went to rent a movie for the group and he brought it back and he brought back cloak and dagger and I almost lost my mind. I'm like, this is the greatest sleepover I've ever been to in my life because I so wanted to see cloak and dagger, obviously for who was starring in it and the previews made it look pretty cool. And uh, I so wanted to see this movie and here just, I I didn't like, I didn't even know it was on video at the moment. So just like he brings home cloak and dagger and we watched it that night. I'm like, this is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Uh, I was nine, probably nine years old, nine to ten years old at the time, and uh, and we'll talk about how how this movie has aged in some respect, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, um, it. I th- I'm meeting with my aunt next week, and I'm going to ask her if she has memories of how she acquired a copy of it because it mm. was a bootleg of sorts. Um, and I mean, I know people were we're probably dubbing tapes at this point, right? You know, oh, um, I, I, you know, that's a story for another time that I actually had someone in my very class who's quote unquote uncle, uh, had a bunch of bootleg tapes like return of the Jedi and a Christmas story. That was how I thought Christmas story. The first time was on a hmm. bootleg VHS tape, actually a very good one. Not, I mean, it's, it's I think the, it might've been a, a dub that one. But there was other ones where it's clear not just a dub. Like Jedi was not a dub. Uh, 
but I don't remember him. I don't remember Cloak and Dagger being one of them. That's not how I saw that. Yeah, it was it was pretty surreal um, going back and watching it, especially on this pristine 4K that Vinegar Syndrome. Jeez, uh, mm-hmm. mad kudos, man, all around for that package. It's just the gl- package itself glorious. is about as good as the movie. Yeah, I mean, when, I, when when I open that package up, and it has a similar, it's, it's it's a bulky package and a similar design to what they did with the Beastmaster 4K, the way you open it and whatnot. And when I opened the Cloak and Dagger 4K, and I was greeted with the inside packaging that was designed after an Atari 5200 case, I almost I almost lost my mind. Right. I'm like, this is this is absolutely amazing. This the the, the detail. Uh, I mean, it's not quite Atari 5200. It's a little, you know, rights and all that kind of stuff. But it's the same design. Exactly. And it even has yeah. a little <laughs> a little uh, price tag on it, uh, which at first I thought said Venture on it. And if it was said Venture <laughs> on it uh, for us Chicagoans and whatnot, that, that would have been, I mean, the, the greatest Blu-ray, re- Blu-ray release of the year. Uh, but it's still, I mean, but it's up there regardless. I mean, it's, oh, no, it's the, really a fantastic package. The attention to detail is, is spectacular. And mm-hmm. yeah, and, and, and watching it, it was just like, I actually have memories because I watched this movie so much of when on the dubbed VHS that my aunt gave me, when the little rainbows would show up occasionally. Like, you know, mm-hmm. on, on, <laughs> on the actual tape, like, oh, I remember after Davey gets, uh, you know, um, trapped by the security guard in the Alamo, I would always see a rainbow at a specific point in the film. Like, that's how embedded mm-hmm. this movie is, where it's like, oh my gosh, yeah, there's little uh, sound cues and things that we're all going to talk about. There's so much to dive into with this particular film. And I, I, I don't think we'll run out of things to say. Sometimes it's tricky though, because I always wind up wanting to watch the movie. <laughs> and course, like, yeah. I'm like, Oh, I want to watch this scene as opposed to talk about it or talk over it. But well, well, that's when we know, that's when we know the other person needs to chime in at that point. That's how that's the, the beauty of a dual commentary is that you don't have to do it all by yourself. Oh, right, right, right. I, I, I've tried <laughs> so. doing a couple of them by myself and whoo, they were challenging but you did a great job with career opportunities that's for sure thank you thank yeah. you very much all right let's do this um okay so yeah i'm gonna tell our listeners that uh they want to sync up their copy of uh, cloak and dagger maybe uh, it is the actual new 4k release from vinegar syndrome but um some people might be streaming this as well I would say try to find the spot right where the Universal logo comes completely into view, meaning you see the words Universal and then right under it an MCA company, and then you want to hit pause. It's about, I guess if you are streaming this online, it'd probably be about 22 seconds in or so. But when you see the Universal logo come completely into view, hit pause, and you'll have your copy synced up with ours. So go ahead and do that first. All right, welcome back. You did it. <laughs> you synced up your copy, and now we're both going to do a countdown. Well, I'm going to do the countdown, and then uh, Eric and I are both going to hit play, and we're going to watch Richard Franklin's Cloak and Dagger. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, play. All righty. The old school Universal logo, of course. My favorite studio as a kid. Yeah. Oh, I got to turn down my volume on the movie. Just you're, you're missing the score, pal. Oh my gosh, that score is just <laughs> oh so haunting at the beginning here, and then it suddenly it gets a little childlike once yep. you see the title. Yeah. And then it just sort of launches right in, which is mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah, so th- like I said, this is a movie for me that I think I've memorized everything about, every sound, certain Foley drops, score cues. Um, you know, and, and I know we talked about how The Last Starfighter was more like my Star Wars since I had seen that first. Uh, I would probably had seen this maybe around the si- same time as I first saw E.T. Because mm-hmm. uh, you, you, you definitely saw E.T. in the theater, right? Multiple when it first times. came out, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what I thought. Three it times. Took, it mm-hmm. took me a while to get to it. I actually saw it as a double feature with um, "Follow That Bird" in 1985. <laughs> I remember. I remember that double feature existing. Yes, isn't that weird? It's a weird mm-hmm. double feature, but no, it worked for me. Um, 
I identified m- deeply with this movie because I had just gotten into video games. And I'm not a, much of a gamer now, mm. especially. But back then, I really loved playing Atari and my dad's computer games and all that stuff. And I happened to have a girl... Uh, next door best friend <laughs> that looked a lot like Kim Gardner. So hmm. it's just a little weird how this movie kind of reflect my own childhood to some degree. If I should just mention right there, we just saw the credit music composed by Brian May. Yes, it's not and the same the, Brian May well, I, from Queen. No, yeah, well, not, well, it took me a few years to realize that. When I first saw that credit at the sleepover where I first saw this movie, I thought that was amazing because I knew who the members of Queen were at that right. point because they were my favorite band and i'm like oh my god i didn't know the guy from queen did the score for this movie this is awesome and of course yeah. it's not he's an australian composer named brian may who's also done some of the george miller stuff and <laughs> right away very cool absolutely uh dab, dab Nicole coleman as james bond essentially mm-hmm which is a weird thing to see i mean a war, war games and war games will come up a n- number of times during this commentary but you know other than war games you know my general impression of dabney coleman was obviously in comedy everything mm-hmm. that i'd seen of him up to that point you know it was nine to five modern problems and tootsie yep you know so like seeing him in war games and this as and he you know he does a lot of uh, light comedy in this one as well but it's just it, 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 it was always cool to see an actor not, I don't want to say out of their comfort zone, but just out of you know, just doing something different as a kid when you're discovering what acting is and what directing is and all these kind of things. And it, I don't know, it was, just, it was just cool to see him in a role like this and play the tough guy. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And and earlier he was actually whistling the score, which I always thought was cute. <laughs> Love that. Well, that's, yep. yeah, well, that's uh, establishing right away in a John Williams kind of way that Jack Flack has his own theme music. Yes. Very, I'm going to very, I'm going to get you sucker. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, this is a wonderful sequence here, too. And completely from a child's point of view, in terms of how it mm-hmm. plays out, you know? Yeah. Cool. I wouldn't even say Davy's a child. He's uh, 11, I believe, or 12. I think. Oh, I would say he's 10, 11. Yeah. I, I, I always kind of picture him as a 10 year old. Uh, I, I always, I, you know, Henry Thomas to me was my age when I right, saw these movies. Right. So that, I mean, that's, that's how I viewed him. I think he was a few, a, a couple years older than I was, but the characters he played were always my age. Cause mm-hmm. that was who I was identifying with. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. And, and there's just, it's just, you know, it's, this is, this is a PG rated movie. It's, it gets pretty dark. Um, screenplay by Tom Holland, of course, Mm-hmm. who uh, would later go on to do Fright Night, another movie where uh, you know a teenager essentially is trying to convince people, hey, uh, something weird's going on with this neighbor. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, now we jump, and clearly it's like playing like a Dungeons & Dragons version of Cloak & Dagger there. Yeah. Henry Thomas finally getting to play one of these games that he didn't get to play in E.T. Oh yeah. And then we will, and we'll see later that he doesn't get to play Dungeons and Dragons anymore either. Yeah. But I think actually Tom Holland built a lot of the characterization of Davy around Henry Thomas, uh, like, you know, just sort of shadowing him and seeing how he plays and what he's into. Like some of the games like Dungeons and Dragons, Henry Thomas mm-hmm. was actually playing at the time. And it's such a great. I mean, it, it, it's the you know when we when we were younger and a lot of these movies, which we'll talk about this period that these movies were being released, all these movies that were geared towards kids and, and the kid protagonist basically, mm-hmm. and the character of Davy Osborne, it, it felt like me, like I was the guy that would go around with the you know a like gun in my hand and going on adventures and making the sound effects oh, and yeah. stuff which we'll see him do so often through this and it's just like I'm, I'm, it's like I'm watching myself on screen yeah and it's it's, it's <laughs> and again a movie about lost innocence later on in the film like it gets really dark yeah like oh, you yeah. mentioned and it, yeah it made me a little sad watching it as an adult now because like oh yeah i'm not this i'm not the, i'm not a kid anymore <laughs> clearly uh if you look at a poster up there you can see et right there mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a japanese poster that's the part of the 
game, the the Atari, you know, which is essentially this this movie came out right around the time of what, what's often known as the, the the video game crash, because not the Cronenberg. Movie, <laughs> um, <laughs> the that would have really sunk the Atari twenty six hundred. No kidding. But the I mean, but this period of of home gaming basically, which this movie you know sort of lovingly uh, has, a, has a great fondness for, is that. You know, if, you know, at one point you you were either the kid on the block that had the Atari twenty six hundred, or you had an Intellivision. Mm. Okay, and then it evolved later on that either you were the kid on the block that had the ColecoVision or the Atari fifty two hundred. Yeah, or or you just knew someone that had one of those game systems at some point. I only had a twenty six hundred, uh, so I was there for the the, the great ET failure and, and all that stuff, but. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, this is geared right when Atari Fifty Two Hundred should have been really taking off, but uh, ultimately, you know, failed along with a few other things. Yeah, well, I mean, I know uh, both Richard Franklin and Tom Holland sort of collaborated on this film together, uh, thanks to their success working on Psycho Two. I believe mm-hmm. it was a year before, right? Uh, 83. Well, 82 Psycho oh, 2 came out. Okay. It was the summer of, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, they were kind of, I guess, not necessarily commissioned, but asked to incorporate Atari into the film, and you see a lot of product placement of that uh, throughout, which, again, like, I mean, we talked about The Last Starfighter, again, another movie that was sort of tied into the video game universe, um, they were both released on the same day as a double feature, which I, I can't believe that happened. Like if I was, I wish I can go back in time and experience that, <laughs> to, you know, when I was seriously, younger, you know, well, I probably wouldn't have been able to get into that either Yeah, <laughs> because I kept getting twice that summer. I got shut out of the last Starfighter cause it was sold out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that story in a bit too, but. Yeah, I mean, and then people, you know, when we when we see the Cloak and Dagger game, we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that w- it was supposed to be this big tie-in for this movie, and that sure. ultimately didn't come out. Um, no, but was, I do remember playing the actual arcade version of it at uh, at an arcade. You're luck- lucky for you. I never got to experience that. It wasn't there very long. <laughs> I remember yeah, that. Right. Was it called Cloak and Dagger or was it called Agent X? I'm pretty sure it was called Cloak and Dagger, but okay. I'm again memory. You know how that how that can be. It might be fuzzy, but well, that's what's funny. We're going to hear Coleman as Jack Flack here in a moment, uh, which is now when you when you know the story of that game that it was originally being designed. It was it was a game called Agent X, right? And when they eventually found out that it had something in common with this, they eventually you know changed it to Cloak and Dagger. But then Coleman in the movie then says like they used to refer back when I was referred to as Agent X, which is it's a it's a shout out to a, an in joke that doesn't really exist. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just can't believe how blase the security guard is towards this kid carrying a fake gun. But these were very different times, people. Very different we, times. We could carry yeah a, a, a fake cap gun around wherever we wanted to basically. Cap guns, water pistols. Um, I mean, most water pistols. I mean, if the ones you would normally have at least were colorful. You know, they're blue, they're red, and you could see that there's water in them. But like, he's got a gun that looks like a gun, and well, there's a real one. Yep. Uh, Tim Rasevich is one of the heavies there. Former football player. Mm-hmm. Turns into the Hulk, which we'll see a little later on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's interesting. Maybe have you can comment on this too. That we saw there as they as they're beginning this adventure, we see the words on uh, Morris's computer where it says "Game Start, Game Start," mm. and there are people that you know have the. I mean, I'm thinking it's there for for a reason that you're almost meant to think that this is the real game, okay? But people have also put forth the theory that none of this actually happens, that it's actually within All in Davy's mind. mind. Oh, no, we're going to go down Fight Club territory. Uh, uh, yeah, Jack Flack doesn't exist. It's a part of his... It is a, he is gonna, a part of his imagination, obviously. Yeah. Well, well, I'll definitely get into that later, too. But the uh, but it also it reminds me of, like, the, of Total Recall, that you, the, the, you know, that moment where he goes into the recall thing... And you see him go under 
and whatnot, and he's you know the the, the vision of Rachel Tickerton is on the screen. Right. Is everything after that happens something is just the the implant in his mind or not? Mm. Uh, I think it's with Total Recall, it's a little more pronounced. I think that you could make that comparison. I think here it's a a lot more of a stretch. Uh, but I'm just uh, you know I go yeah, this all this all happens as far as I'm concerned. Well, a lot of people point out some of the implausibilities that occur and I'm not going to argue those. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I guess you can blame nostalgia and certain, and a certain love for this movie as a whole that I can't necessarily objectively criticize some of the choices or some of the things that take place. I really just completely like separate the critic <laughs> in me mm -hmm. in this movie you know and that happens for certain titles from the past i mean i could see why people had the criticisms that they do but i just they don't register for me and we'll talk well, about some of them yeah they're worth discussing absolutely oh, yeah Here's no definitely jack flack yay and th that's what i and that was i remember when i saw this for the first time when you, you obviously it's a figment of his imagination because he just appears like that right but the, the fact that davy just immediately it's not like a in, in a lot of movies like this would it would be like a big surprise like oh my god you're real but it's just like oh hi jack like this is a completely <laughs> normal thing that happens every day for davy yeah I wonder if just that that's just his way to deal with a stressful situation, you know, to like it's maybe his conscience. You can think of that, too, like a manifestation of just his inner thoughts in a way. But, um, yeah, you know, it's I I can't specifically say I had an imaginary friend, but I would talk to myself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, Maybe not outright in public sometimes, but this yeah. is this is a clear indication that Richard Franklin is a Hitchcock guy. Clearly, uh, you know, he's His sort of self. Works, yeah, he self-proclaimed that really. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was just a student of Hitchcock's films. I just watched them all the time. Uh, yeah. Rear Window Homage, which I believe the source material was uh, from a book called "The Boy Who Cried Murder," and that was actually adapted into a film called "The Window." which I finally watched for the first time, and I was like, oh, that's good, but it's no Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> right. And this person happens to be the Candyman from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the owner of the candy store. And I didn't know that until I recently looked up uh, some trivia, and I was like, what? Because that's another movie I watched many, many times yeah. as a kid. But I think he's uncredited. Like, if you go on IMDb, you don't see his uh, his credit, his name. In this or in, in Willy Wonka? Um, in this. Oh. Such a okay, small this, role. This yeah. is amazing right here. Yeah. Again, you there's, you there's no reason you need that shot. Right. And that's why it's awesome. Yep. Like, you don't have to go to that lanes to show that he just fell down the entire stairwell. Yeah, I, I I read so many um, accounts of people who saw this as a kid and like I was traumatized. There were so many things in this movie that mm -hmm. freaked me out, and that's definitely There's one of them. There's nightmare fuel in this. Oh yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Um, now, if you want to play up the "this is all in Davy's imagination" thing, this is obviously one of those moments because how did they clear not, up that body so fast? Not only did they clear up the body, but there's no blood anywhere. Yep. Like they did a pretty fabulous job here. Yeah, because that was like in 30 seconds, all that happened. You know, it's just yeah. And it's also the, like you you talk about the inherent danger of this movie, and this is obviously one of the things I think many people probably in modern day have a problem with this movie is that, I mean, this kid is in moral danger from this point on through the entire, the end of the movie. And like, but, it, but there's no apologies for it either because as soon as he sees that body fall, what do the bad guys do? They immediately take a shot at him. Right. There, there's no scruples like, Oh my God, I don't know if I should shoot a kid. No, he immediately takes a shot at mm -hmm. this kid. And poor Davy, how can he not be traumatized? How many years of therapy is he going to need after all these events? Well, when we get to when we introduce his father in a moment, I'll talk to maybe a little bit more about Henry Thomas's trauma um, oh. in the movies that he was making at this time. No kidding. 
But he's uh, such. I mean, yeah. I mean, Dabney Coleman has talked about. Um, he talked about in many interviews over the years that what a great time he had making this movie with Henry Thomas. He did not get along with the director. Correct. Um, he didn't go in, into too many details about that that I could find. But he always praised Henry Thomas. He always had a smile on his face when he talked about him. He said he was absolutely professional. Uh, that he would uh, actually like go off. Uh, screen, or maybe that was Franklin that maybe that said that, but like he would just learn his lines like right before they'd go to camera, hmm. and he would just come back and then immediately do the lines. Oh man, yeah, one of the all-time great child actors, without a doubt, mm-hmm. in every way. Yeah, and so identifiable. It's like I just immediately gravitated towards him when I was younger and just went, oh, that's 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 me. <laughs> I wore those striped shirts, and I had a little red backpack. <laughs> and my dad was a lot like Dabney Coleman, including the mustache. <laughs> nice. Here's RoboCop's commander sending Davy home. Yeah, and I also thought of... Uh, he plays the cook in Miracle Mile. I, uh, that's right. That's I, right. Yes. I, that's another movie. Uh, yeah, that I, you know, when I first rented it with my dad, we were like, okay, we're traumatized by watching Miracle Mile, mm-hmm. but uh, we're grateful to have seen it. And again, this is another. I mean, the, the opening of that door, and you don't quite, you don't immediately see Dabney's face. It's a wonderful reveal because it allows the audience to then process the whole imagination aspect of Jack Flack. That it's not that his dad looks like Jack Flack; it's that Jack Flack looks like his dad. Right. And it's such a you you put that together in your own mind, and either you surmise that this is the guy that you want your dad to be, and I think that's a little too simplistic. I think this is the manifestation of like his dad is his hero. Mm-hmm. He just doesn't quite know it yet. Yeah. Uh, and because and it's, it's the authority figure in his life, and you know, I mean, who would it be? It'd be him or Morris. It's either Dabney Coleman or Bill Forsythe, basically. And uh, Dabney Coleman looks better in a that jacket. <laughs> yeah, and this is where we learn about um, the fact that Davy lost his mother, and mm-hmm. you know, they're going through a lot. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's clear that. David probably does need to be in therapy, but I I think uh, (laughs) his way of coping is by playing video games or escaping or yeah, spending time with uh, yeah with his with his uh, best friend and and doing little adventures like that. I mean, I think I think Davy's games are not a a way to avoid his problems. Maybe that's kind of how his dad sees it a little bit, but they are tools that he's using to work through you know, his trauma or his, or whatever he's experiencing as a, as a kid, you know, I think once again, it makes me correlate like those types of coping strategies as not being bad. You know, I think he's having fun (laughs) because everyone processes grief their own way. And I think that, I I think sometimes when you try to over, over prescribe what someone is going through, I mean, you're going to hear his dad make several mentions about going to see this doctor and whether that's that's directly connected to the fact that he's talking to an imaginary friend or not uh, is not specifically spelled out. But but you're right. I mean, you you want to lose yourself. That's just one way of coping with grief is just losing yourself in fantasy or work or whatever you know whatever age you might be. And you know he doesn't have a job obviously, so he loses it in fantasy. Kind of like we do with we're watching movies. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're not avoiding reality. We're using them to work through our own issues or to empathize with others or yeah. to try to understand this messed up world we're living in. <laughs> and here's another, again, the, you, you watch this scene and I've seen people make commentary that there's there's this real distance between father and son. But look at the shot right mm, here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, with any, real, you know, parental real son or child relationship, there's going to be some distance and people don't know how to deal with certain things and whatnot but he you know his dad's working through this he's not some tyrant he's not someone who doesn't necessarily understand his son he's they're both going through this together and there are a few moments here where yeah he doesn't believe him but what parent is going to necessarily believe that armed killers are chasing you through san antonio i mean come on so well especially since 
he's had the tendency to immerse himself in the world of games before, you know, and just mm-hmm. like, of course, he's going to try to, you know, recreate those scenarios in in, yeah. in, in different ways. And, he, and here we get to see the actual game, although <laughs> the cartridge itself doesn't exist in, in real nope. in, in reality. This is the stand up arcade game that was wired into a, a screen. So mm-hmm. there's like a separation, like there's clever editing going on here. Oh yeah. And always, and always, I was always upset. I never got to play this game. Right. Cause it seemed like, you know, at the time, and this is 1984, uh, compared to some of the games that I was playing on the Atari 2600, this looked like revolutionary stuff. Oh, I know. I know. And I, I'm I'm still amazed that I got to play it a couple of times, but I wanted to play it at home on a cartridge mm-hmm. because I saw this movie. I was like, oh, I should be able to, right? Isn't it out there? And no, it's not. He's very good at the first round. He's not so great with the second round. Mm. Coming up here, yeah. he, he he he. I think he gets a little too cocky. You yeah. watch him play the second round here. He tries to light a few few things, and he should have escaped a lot quicker. He's trying to get like he's trying to get some extra points there. Not That's real, good. not making the connection that he needs a million three hundred twenty nine thousand <laughs> points. Yeah, he, that's going to take a long blur. time. That's going to take a long time to play that. Yeah, t- to get to that score. Yeah. So this is this is a rough moment right here. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. But I think every child has those moments of, like, I don't know, just separating separating themselves from their parents and just not capable of that kind of mm-hmm. empathy at that point in time. You know, just like... Oh, definitely. Yeah, just, uh, all right, you don't understand me. I'm just going to shut okay. down, so... And this is interesting, too, because we had heard this speech back in 1984 about heroes are the ones who fix bicycles and put food on the table... Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until 1989 that Chaz Palminteri did his one-man show for Bronx Tale oh, that eventually right. became, a, you know, De-, De Niro made the movie in 1993, and De Niro has a very similar speech that the working man is the real hero, not the mm-hmm. gangster that you're looking up to. Uh, so I will never forget watching a Bronx Tale and hearing that speech and just like, that's Davy's dad's speech. Yeah. You gotta watch a very obvious cut coming here. That's the only time I'm like I laugh a little bit. Right there, there you go. That's uh, not Dabney yeah. Coleman as That's the dad. Not Dabney Coleman. <laughs> oh, we can't <laughs> expect perfection, you know. No. But they do their best. Yeah, and here yeah. we go. This... You ever had someone call up your house and say your name and go good? Uh... <laughs> yeah, had prank callers, happened. I'm sure, but no, nothing like this. No. And just, yeah, I, I think for all future generations, if you have a baseball or a softball, don't write your full name on it, maybe. I said, don't, do not put your middle initial yeah. on it, you know? There, yeah, I there, know. Are, other, there are other <laughs> balls out there, Davey. You, you can get another ball. Exactly. <laughs> maybe he had sentimental attachment to that particular ball. I'm surprised he didn't realize, oh, I, I lost my ball. You know, there's in the scene where he's like, but I guess we don't need that either. That might be super no. superfluous, but... <laughs> Considering what he was going through at the time, I don't yeah, think the ball that's true. was his top part. See, now, now here, again... Oh, nice yeah, we had dream. those moments when you had a bad dream or something. Yeah, I, st- I, st- I still did that. Of yep. course. Mm-hmm. And again, it's, it, it's another, you know, if the dad was a just a dick, <laughs> he might <laughs> say, like, go sleep in your own room, you little shit. Um, yeah, you're all grown up. What the hell? You right. <laughs> you're, you're 10 years old now. See, again, you know, this is two minutes after he just said, I hate you. And they don't hate each other. They're just, no. you know, they got moments like every child and parent do. He's not a bad father, anyone out there saying he is. Yeah. But it is interesting, you know, what you're watching this movie, and something I always thought about is, you know, both uh, Davey and Kim live in this complex here, which is clearly why they're, they're friends. It's a big part of it. But they're, you know, they're basically both latchkey mm-hmm. kids. Yep. Uh, which people, I don't know, does that term still exist? <laughs> I don't know. Nowadays? I don't think we use it as that much, was, no. That was, I mean, that was such a term back in when we were growing up that it was on the news. Like, here's the story about latchkey kids. 
and which is basically your parents who have to work and they have to kids would have to come over to school and they'd have to have their own key to enter their homes. And we saw that earlier that Kim has a key. You know, don't worry, I got a key, and he she just walks into the house. Yep. And I mean the and I mean the, it, the, the coolest currency these kids have is their bus pass. They can go <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> it's amazing that they, that we're at a, a place in 1984 it shows you what a different time it was. And you're not going to let nowadays 10 year olds run around with here's a bus pass kid go wherever the hell you want no kidding i know i think that's what made it a little bit more melancholy watching it now and this time just like knowing like oh yeah you know i think it's because of all the shit going on in the world and the school shootings and everything i just go yeah i'm feeling that um again that 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 word nostalgia for a different time when yeah, I could just go anywhere. <laughs> I could walk around the yeah. neighborhood and feel safe and not have to worry. And yeah. yeah, nowadays kids really don't have this kind of freedom. I was left home quite a bit, you know. And I mean, I think my grandmother would come over to babysit once in a while, but mm-hmm. I don't know. There were times where I, yeah, I think my parents were just like, um, yeah, either working or out uh, socializing and doing their thing, and I yeah. was like left home alone and watching movies. <laughs> so. But um, no, like I said, I I I I had a friend. Um, it was a ver- it was a very much a my girl situation, <laughs> where we would hang out all the time, uh, mostly outside, and uh, yeah, we did have little adventures. We didn't have walkie talkies though, which would have been super cool. It's like I like how she just has it sitting there at the breakfast table. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how about giving a little love just to have a, a movie like this and just have this a, a friendship between a young boy and a young girl that is not just him and his you know buddy from school or something like that it's just these two kids who live in the same complex and become really close friends yeah and the and, and you know she's a girl he's a boy and she's frequently embarrassed by his antics yeah but Great she line. accepts she, Great yeah, line there yeah she accepts him as he is yeah it's a wonderful Jeez, friendship. Toasted wheat and raisins. <laughs> I don't think I ever had that. I know no. I had. Sh- I know I had shredded wheat, of course. Or shredded wheat. I don't yeah. remember. I and mean, that's a, it looks like an Abisco brand there. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Okay, here's okay. Nightmare oh, God. fuel. Oh God. Starting up right here. Of especially, things, especially for happened. our colleague uh, Nick DiGiulio, who had a home invasion experience at a young age. I can't yeah. imagine how he feels watching this scene. Well, I I still don't answer the door. I mean, <laughs> just as a general <laughs> rule, uh, that, you know, unless I've invited somebody over, there's no reason for me to answer a door to an unannounced visitor. Right. If you're delivering something and you knock on my door and just leave it there, that's great. But or a food delivery or something like that. But other than that, there's no reason for, I'm answering the door for anybody. Oh, that's so nice. He just wanted to return his ball. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what he was hoping to open the window. Okay, look at this. This is beautiful. Oh, okay. man. Yeah. You can I tell mean, he was a former football player. He's built. Yeah. Good this, lord. Just anytime you see a guy in a tracksuit now from now on, you just run. Yeah, he's the brother of uh, Rick Rosevich, who, yes. uh, from, from Roxanne, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And the Terminator. He also <laughs> Rick Rosovich did not have a great time in the Terminator with glass, and uh, so he had a very bad experience with glass. And Tim Rosovich here, obviously, he goes through the glass door there unscathed, then, unscathed. But then we'll see later on it becomes his downfall. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Him and Keith Gordon. It's just it was not a good time Ooh. to go through a windshield. <laughs> oh, of course. Just saying. Yeah. I like the fact that Tim Rosovich, as the heavy, is just wearing a sweatsuit the whole movie from this point mm-hmm. on, I think. Yes. And, of course, okay, we got to we... mention William Forsythe, right? Did we, we mention well, we have to mention We have to mention William Forsythe and just the character of Morris in general, because this is the only time we ever see him out front manning the store. Right. He's you know, always I mean, hanging I don't out in the how, back. He's, yeah. he's always hanging out in the back. There's, he doesn't have an employee here. The, people could just... I mean, there's a reason that Davey can get away with this cloak and dagger tape. It's the easiest... I mean, it's amazing he doesn't just walk out and the entire store is bare. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I don't think he has security cameras there. I don't know what he's playing there. Well, he's creating a game. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's been he's been working at creating a game. I don't know. And there was some controversy about like th- these being referred to as tapes. Yeah. Uh, silly. I mean, they're, yeah. yeah. I mean, I refer to them as I, I refer to them as both. I you know Atari a, a cartridge. I, you know when I put them in, I would call them a cartridge, but. Uh, people ask me about my Atari tapes, I would not take offense. Right. I know exactly. This is definitely one of the earliest roles for William Forsyth. Mm-hmm. He actually gained weight for this performance. <laughs> Did he? He ate a lot of Twinkies. No, I don't, I don't know. Uh... <laughs> and you can see the Cloak and Dagger board game version there. It's still there. Mm-hmm. And you know the Atari, you know people are just like, well, it's just a, a advertisement for Atari products and whatnot. And yeah, sure, but there are many shots of ColecoVision outside the store, so it's not that blatant. But he only has an Atari Fifty Two Hundred connected to his back room where he's not doing any work whatsoever. Mm-hmm. There's and a little game, a- ADR moment too. there. There's mm-hmm. weird. I always thought that was weird even when I was a kid. Like, you hear him say no, but his mouth doesn't m- say the word no mm-hmm. <laughs> at that moment. I think it was my yeah. first realization. Like, oh, yeah, they probably over. Uh, watch that. Him, he grabs 100,000 points right off the bat. Boom. Right? He's, I mean, he's, he's almost there. He's a savant. <laughs> he, he knows exactly yeah, what he's, he's doing. Right, yeah, well, he skipped levels to where the higher points values are. Yeah. Now, when you see the Atari 5200 games here... We'll talk about that in a second, but you count how many of them you actually played at arcades. <sighs> I know one of them is Tempest. I definitely mm-hmm. played that. Uh, no, I have more memories of like your really basic 2600 games. Yeah. You know, I mean, certainly your missile command. Like, there's, there's an arcade not too far from where I live now that I got to go in there sometime just so I can play Space Invaders and a bunch of old school stuff that mm-hmm. they have there. It's a bar arcade, but yeah. Well, I talked about on another friend's podcast recently the whole idea that uh, you know Xbox and you know everything that's so pronounced right now, and I have which I have, but I go on there and I buy old Atari twenty six hundred packets, sure, <laughs> you know, and just to play those again. Yeah, a lot of modern games are way too complicated for me. Yeah. Defender, I definitely played. I played Ms. Pac-Man and Defender, like the really basic ones. I never got yeah. too too deep into it. Pango was the Penguin game. Ah, oh yeah, yeah. Kang- Galaxian. Kangaroo. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely played. Battle Galaxian. Zone was a tank game. Now this is interesting. I always, I, I always question this too. That, I mean, he he opens the package up and it's it's got the sticker for the. Company, yeah. his store on the back of it. So is Morris opening up? I mean, I suppose that's that's one way to p- prevent the fact people from stealing, considering you're always in the back room. But I mean, would you buy a game like that and that was opened up? I, I mean, wonder I if he had a shrink wrap machine that he would just <laughs> re shrink wrap the game. To. Yeah, yeah, he would have had to. I know he had one at the video store I worked at. Um, when we would, yeah, I too. guess, you know, re-shrink wrap our DVDs and put them out mm-hmm. for sale or something, I think. I can't remember the reason why we used it. But on the, on the prior scene when Michael Murphy is telling him where to go, he, he refers to, the, you know, this is called the Japanese Sunken Gardens. Mm. For many for many years, I always thought he said Japanese sucking. <laughs> yeah, so did I. <laughs> uh, because I always, I always like like that wasn't the name of it. That he just added the word sucking because he was just so upset that yep. he had to go through this with Davy. You know the Japanese sucking gardens, you little yeah. suck. Michael Murphy, what a what a <sighs> tremendous villain performance in this. I mean, God, he, he's so. I mean, he's almost unnecessarily evil. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like he probably could have reasoned with this kid. I mean, well, not after you've seen the murders, obviously, but it's just no, there's, there's no wiggle room here. Mm-hmm. And he's mostly okay. known for playing a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're living danger. Li- oh, you're right. living dangerously, yeah. which is That's where true. I knew of Michael Murphy at a, an age that I probably shouldn't have seen that movie. But, okay, now here you have the two bad guys threatening to throw this little girl <laughs> off a cliff. 
I guess nobody notices those types of things at this time. No. But, uh, I'm surprised she's not screaming a little bit more, freaking out, but maybe she knows that she, you know, yeah. they, they will hurt her if they, she does mm-hmm. that. So she's a smart kid. I love Murphy's dialogue, too. I'm a kid at heart. Hey, we have I have some friends, and we play, too. And if I don't get this tape to them, your friend's going to die. Yep. <laughs> He's so good in this. I'm trying to think of where I first saw him. It might have just been this movie, I honestly. Mm. I think. But then I just, uh, you know, when I went back and binged a bunch of Altman movies, he would show up. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> He's a great actor. I... I, I most recently maybe away from her right he was um in sarah polly's away from her in a smaller Mm. role Mm. and you'd appreciate davies the character like that is savvy too to like okay when he pulls the gun on him here it's just i mean this is what you hope you might do as a kid if you had that option yeah. Not that it would be a real gun, obviously, but okay. And again, it's that's kid stuff, but that's cheerworthy in mm-hmm. the theater. Qual- yeah, quality blood, too. Quality mm-hmm. fake blood. Yeah. Uh, uh, shouldn't, that shouldn't have been on there. No. Because now they know where to go. Yeah. Uh, Morris killed himself, basically. Yeah, by putting those little stickers on. But that's the mm. the little touches like that through the script is what I think makes it strong. Whereas other people go, "Oh, those are conveniences, huh?" And I'm like, oh, "No, come on. that that's no, that's absolutely part of the brilliance of this script." Yeah, because I mean, it's a it's a fantasy, and you can call it a, a Hitchcockian fantasy, if you will, just done through the eyes of a kid. Like this is what a kid's version of a Hitchcock movie would probably feel like. And just all those little touches, and here's another great, just another good piece of directing here by Franklin, just letting this play out between these two really good child actors, yeah. uh, and then letting the van come up to him Slowly uh, like into was, view, was, yeah, that's a total <laughs> Hitchcock like, moment, yeah. Yeah. One, one shot here. Yeah, very subtle and show. It's like the opposite of what De Palma does, you know, yeah. in terms of just like letting the scenes play out in this organic manner and right. focusing on the characters and their relationship. It's really smart. And again, everything that Davy has to do to you know wrangle his way out of these situations, the, the what what he has to do to get off the bus here. I mean, the, the quick yeah. thinking of this kid is one of the things that endears you to him. And it's not that he's doing something that is so, you know, it's not like, you know, forgive me, but Lex in Jurassic Park knowing how to, you know, <laughs> solve the security problems with the computer. You know, it's not quite like that. It's just, it's little ways of a way a kid would get out of situations. Fake throwing up, right? Yeah. Here. And this whole film was shot on location in San Antonio where yeah. Henry Thomas grew up. Yeah. So this just must have been an adventure for him too. It's like, you know, going back to your right. hometown and getting to relive all these locations and things. Great. Another great shot here. Yep. Again, shooting at this child in public. <laughs> yep. Nobody I pays mean, no mind. I mean, I guess he just does it. And, you know, I mean, people could probably make that, uh, claim that oh yeah this is playing out in his, yeah. in his head like those two people were, were just right there and did it's they see it far behind yeah yeah and well this was i mean this was a period where there weren't cameras everywhere so i mean you couldn't just see smollett your way out of, <laughs> out of you know a situation yeah. plus the gun had a silencer on it so yeah so i mean yeah it's not making a lot of noise mm-hmm oh we need it we need a spin-off origin story of morris that's what that's what we should have. Like in in this day and age, <laughs> if this movie had become a hit, like we get all the subplots and side characters, we'd learn yeah. everything about them and where they come from. <laughs> like he would be like the guy. Like there's probably like other adventures, other game tapes and stuff like that, and other video game like detective stories that he would be the Q sort of thing. He'd, they'd be the guy that he'd have to bring, keep bringing stuff to, and this would be his final moment, of course. Yep. 
Discovery. And again, this is all this is all MacGuffin material. It doesn't necessarily matter what's on here, but you see the words "invisible bomber." You go, "This is important." Um, yeah, a stealth bomber that would actually, yeah, be uh, come into fruition in reality. Uh, yeah, later later on, this was a time of espionage and Cold War scares too. You know, <laughs> so yeah, you know, it's smart of them to sort of just incorporate that into this kids movie, and maybe that's why even my. My aunt and my dad like this movie, you know? It's mm. it, it appealed to them as adults. Like, they actually really... Because they weren't cinephiles the way I slowly became one, and yet this film, mm. for some reason, they always went, that is that is as good as it gets when it comes to a child film. Or, you know, a film that's made for kids that I can actually enjoy and be entertained by. I was wondering <laughs> if you could... <laughs> this, this, this poor schmuck. Um... <laughs> If you could, if somehow you could creatively edit War Games and this movie together, mm. so it was actually all one movie, and that way you'd have Dabney Coleman playing three roles, like it was Strange Love. Whoa! Uh, and so you have the the nuclear capabilities, and if McKittrick, maybe McKittrick and Davy's father is actually the same person, and given what McKittrick has gone through with David Lightman. That's a reason why he doesn't want his actual son playing these war games. Oh man, you're gonna be you're gonna publish some fan fiction, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Who says I haven't? Oh, yeah, I want to I want to see that. <laughs> well, nowadays everything becomes its own universe, you know. Of course, <laughs> everything is tied is, together. Yes, but you know the Dabney Coleman cinematic universe is something that needs to be. A thing. Oh sure, sure. Yeah, you gotta put you gotta throw in short time. Of course. Yep. Killer car chase in that film that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, of course, when I visited San Antonio with my mom, we did this, and all I could think about was Cloak and Dagger, and I was like, am I going to run into a, a creepy elderly couple on the on the boat ride? I wonder. Was it the exact same location, the river and the tour? I think so, as far as did I can have- remember. Was it Al was, your tour guide? Nope. <laughs> no? It wasn't Al? No, it wasn't, unfortunately. Nobody yelled that the boat was on fire, thankfully, and <laughs> the way people jump ship, we'll get to that. Um, yeah. See, so again, team, teamwork here on part of the bad guys. You get in line, I'll go get the tickets. Mm-hmm. And here's this, uh, this poor guy and his wife. Just fighting the entire time. Again, see, this, is, um, this feels like a De Palma sequence. Because you yeah. have all of these, uh, you know, and, and Hitchcock obviously too, where you have all of these random characters that you don't think are going to be significant and end up steering the direction of the entire scene. Right, but it's not all one shot where <laughs> the camera is right. like sort of, you know, a part of the whole thing. It's just mm-hmm. called attention to it. But Here, here's our tour guide, Al. By the way. mm Hmm. It's a good thing those two weren't on the boat too, because they'd be arguing the entire time. No kidding, that would you be, be able to hear Al. <laughs> we want this <laughs> boat. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely set up like a De Palma sequence. You're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Like, there's little attention to detail here where it's like oh is the boat gonna start oh no, these people are gonna leave and what does that yeah. mean it's like yeah again it's very it's very nightmarish mm-hmm. i mean i i understand as a kid i had seen some hitchcock and you know but watching this you're you're you are the kid like it's it's one thing to watch jimmy stewart it's another thing to watch henry thomas who's yeah. you know around your age be put in this situation and i mean any, anytime there's al um oh. The, the yeah again they're gonna the knife. knife this mm-hmm. child on a public boat, which is something you could do in the eighties apparently. <laughs> yeah, you could smuggle it on there for sure. Mm-hmm. Tim Rob- Rosovich, obviously the brawn of this operation, not really the brains. Correct. He's non with a few extra lines. Oh, poor Al. 
He's just Alex always, always, to down. yeah, always telling him to sit down for Sir. the whole for the whole sequence. I always remember that again that the when I first saw this movie at the sleepover in eighty four eighty five and friends of mine were just like, look at this look that Henry Thomas mm. has given him. Like what? Yeah. I mean, it's just a wonderful like. I'm not taking any crap, you know. Yeah, I'm. I'm, but he's also like, I'm. I'm actually. You can see it sense a little fear in him. Of course, he's. Oh, yeah. He's really good at conveying oh, that. Definitely. Oh, that smile. Ugh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we are about to get an introduction to a very memorable couple who were married mm-hmm. in real life. Speaking of psycho. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, the, the the psycho connections in this movie actually run quite deep, considering you have. Jeanette Nolan and John McIntyre here, who were both in Psycho. Richard Franklin and Tom Holland worked together on Psycho 2. And who would play Norman Bates in Psycho 4, Jim? But Henry Thomas, of course. That's correct. Shot by, or directed by Mick Garris, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wasn't bad. I think it was like a made-for-cable thing, wasn't it, Psycho 4? It it would, yeah, it was a Showtime movie. Oh, Showtime, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. I think I like all the cycle or cycle <laughs> psycho sequels. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why they're on the boat. Are they just like because they're tourists they're and killing fantasy? time? Yeah, I, I I always chalked it up to them killing time. That mm. they they're not scheduled to meet Rice uh, and at the Alamo until later, so they're just killing time. <laughs> You can actually trace. There's like, I mean, you want to talk about origin stories. Oh, this is rough, too. Yep. And I, I love the people are just jumping ship <laughs> this little <laughs> ferry boat. Again, yep. wonderful, wonderful ingenuity to get off the boat. I know. He's su- he's such a quick thinker. All these this people movie, are like. <laughs> this guy. He's like the Titanic. Right. <laughs> But but you, you going back to the 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 couple the Al trying to get these guys to sit down again, the boat is Linda by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the I would be I mean, so the, mad the, at them for yelling fire, you know, like oh they should have pushed them off. They right. should have totally pushed them off the boat. Yeah, but the 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 old couple they I mean they have like an entire schedule going on because later on we you know they, they got a hotel they got to check out of the hotel they had they had dinner reservations those got screwed up. Uh, and they're just killing time. So they're taking a boat ride through San Antonio and they don't have a flight until midnight. Yeah. Later did on. you ever have, did you ever have a Morris in your life? Uh, did I have like somebody I looked up to that was an older adult? Or just someone like in a store like this, like in a mm. like do you ever like go to like a mall or something where you had a rapport or video store even where you had like a rapport with the person? No, not until I, well when I was well into my teen years later on, I'd say. Mm. It was definitely the video store owner of Citizens Video in Griffith, Indiana, a mom okay. and pop video store where I would just go in and yeah and talk to him all the time and it if um, oh, it was just the saddest day though when they told me they were going to close down, but it was mm. also the happiest day because they're like, "You get first dibs on anything you want here." Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't quite get that treatment, but there was a little video store right by the bowling alley where mm. I, I bought at Oak Grove Bowl, and so after Saturday morning bowling, I would go to the video store, and frequently there was a gentleman there that would let me look at the coming soon guy that all video stores got. Aww. So I got to see in advance like when certain things were announced for two months down the road, and I'd write them down so I knew when they were coming to the store. That's so nice. Sadly, yeah. you don't have those kind of relationships yeah. with uh, store owners these days. Right. Again, this is as reckless as anything Jack Fleck tells the boy to do. Right. This just, just, just saying. You're going to comment about him trying to murder someone later. At least acknowledge that he made him cross the street. Love that transition <laughs> mm-hmm. there. Well, well, it's a, it's a wonderful transition because it's like the game. Yeah. It, it, it's exactly like the, the the Jack Flack coming down in the elevator. Mm-hmm. Good call. And why does Rice leave his car unlocked? Hey, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> He's, 
These guys with their private parking spots. Yeah, back then everybody left their car doors unlocked. Yeah. They left their they left their houses unlocked. Mm-hmm. You know. Oh. Shot through the eye too. No kidding. You got Mo Green. How much therapy? I swear, God, poor kid. Well, let's, 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 <laughs> since, you, since you brought that up, let's let's talk about Henry Thomas's therapy. You know, probably just playing these roles. I mean, again, Danny Coleman talked about what a natural actor he was and how good he was at just being able to cry on cue. And obviously, people probably all know his ET audition tape, which is legendary. But I mean, considering, okay, ET, his dad has left him. Right. Yep. Okay. So, and then then his best he gets a best friend and an alien, and then he leaves. Okay. So there's that. Uh, there was a movie that came out earlier in 1984 before this one called Misunderstood. You know, which I with, haven't seen. I've never seen that. It, and, and there was a movie that played on cable on. It was Henry Thomas played the son of Gene Hackman. Right. And as the and as the title tells you, he was misunderstood. It was and it was a, and and what was the premise of that movie? His mom had died. Oh my God. Okay, and if you watch, and you sh- you should see that movie because it's 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 interesting. It's especially to see how good Hackman and Thomas are in it. Oh but boy, it, yeah. But it ends it, the way that that movie ends is, I mean, it, it's almost downright tragic how that movie ends, and it is designed to just bring emotions out of you. Oh, uh, and then <laughs> and then you got this one where his mom's dead. So he's yeah. got like a, 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 a dad that's left him and two dead moms. Yeah, I don't know if I can handle it because, like I told you via email, my dad reminds me of Gene Hackman and Dabney Coleman. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, and of course, I th- I think of Henry Thomas as a young me. So, yeah. oh boy, yeah, that's why this is, is it does get a little emotional. But um, that is a that is a big trunk. Now that I think about it. Well, yeah, it's got to fit the boy and. The imaginary friend and Morris. <laughs> it reminds me of that that uh, the line from Wonder Boys. Uh, now that is a big trunk. It holds a tuba, a suitcase, a dead dog, and a garment bag almost yes. perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, 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 we actually, my grandfather, and then ended up we ended up having it ourselves. We had a Lincoln Continental, uh, mm. which is not quite, but it, it's it was actually it's actually bigger than this car. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, again, not the brains of the operation here. Mm-mm. Yeah, how does nobody see the dead body in the trunk? Well, they just conveniently didn't walk past there. Well, it's Texas. That's the beast. Yeah, the, yeah that makes complete sense to me. They, they ignore problems down there. Disappointed that Davy did not check to see if there was a basement here. Uh, it was before Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh, just a year, yeah. Yeah, another one I watched a lot. But this, this in- is also not the interior yep, of the album. You, you, yep, you, you oh. took the words out of my mouth. But yeah, you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I visited it when I was in San Antonio. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is very so different. They, so they didn't actually try, even try to recreate the how the Alamo looked. They just. Mm, I just remember going, okay, this is not like the movie. I don't think okay. it was dramatically different or anything, but uh, eh, I think they tried. <laughs> okay. They put forth an effort somewhat, but no, it was it was a little different. I'm sure there were renovations between then and when I went. Yeah. But um, this is another sort of De Palma like tracking shot, like a sequence where you're following somebody. Yeah. It's like a dress to kill <laughs> kind of thing, mm-hmm. like with the museum. And there was a there was a shot just before we see him scrolling there, where you actually see the two of them off looking at something under a glass, mm. like he is doing. Uh, so I don't know how she got there that quickly, but doesn't matter. The links that they go to to distract you from, I mean, the reveal that's coming up, not and not too long, is one of those reveals that completely blew my mind. Oh, when I for was sure, there. for sure. Because you never would suspect that. No, and I had a great relationship with my grandparents. So anytime there's like an old couple on screen, I just you, you feel there's like a grandparent, grandfatherly, grandmotherly kind of mm-hmm. thing. You you don't expect what's coming, and 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 again, it's not like they've been in constant contact with Rice, so they don't know what Rice has been going through. 
this entire time. And Rice probably, I assume, explains it to him a little bit when the camera, when they're, they're swapping camera cases. Yeah, they do have the same kind of camera case here. Yeah. And of course, we realize why later on. That's a very Texas line right there. Yep. <laughs> no you kidding. have a hell of a nerve kid stealing <laughs> inside the Alamo as opposed to anywhere else. How mm-hmm. dare you? <laughs> yeah how how he knew that that was rice's camera case i don't know considering i don't know inside. either i was gonna was ask inside the okay. there yeah yeah maybe he just like assumed said, we forget things. i don't know yeah yeah Now, even as a kid, I think we probably should have figured something was up here. But again, we're just blinded by the niceness of these two people, given all the trauma that Davy's gone through for the last 40 minutes. Yeah. It's interesting that, um, yeah, the composer Brian May would go on to do the score a, a year later for a film called The Quest, which I think is under a different title now, isn't it? Oh, I don't know about that. I, I, I know the movie you're talking about, obviously, which I've actually never seen. It's hard to find. I think that's why I haven't seen it. Yeah. Let me double check, because I actually wanted to... I feel like it was... Oh, Frog Dreaming. It's also under a different title called Frog Dreaming. Apparently it's on YouTube, though. It's hmm. an Australian film. It's right. set in, I believe it's set in Australia. Yeah. Again, this is one of those scenes where I'm watching it and want, <laughs> just because I'm anticipating the the big reveal here. It's so mm-hmm. well done. It's so well done. And if you notice, even the lighting changes here. It's very subtle, you know, because it's like a little brighter there uh, at the well, Alamo. Look at, well, look who's behind him. Yep. Rice. You got it. So they they they've set this in motion here, and that's a and again, it's it's not like the van. It's it's very. You have to know what you're looking for. Your focus is all on this, and here we go. Yep, and he put on his headlights there, very subtle. Yep. And now it's gotten way darker in there. Much darker. After the reveal. Night falls quickly in Texas. (laughs) Also, John McIntyre and and Jeanette Nolan were known as uh, being the voices for the rescuers. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of people recognize McIntyre's voice, especially when he said that line, why don't you open it and find out? <laughs> so if we're keeping track of Davy's day here, uh, he's been shot at multiple times. His home has been broken into. He's been chased, almost stabbed, and now he's about to be chloroformed. And his best friend was murdered. <laughs> his best friend was murdered, and he can <laughs> sit in the car with the corpse. Yep. See, the dinner reservations are gone, man. Uh, Davey, you're such a nuisance, I'm going to knock you out. And again, it's really uh, in- ingenious of uh, Jack to suggest, you better play dead right about now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, there's, I mean, again, there's a lot of really wonderful and genius bits here. Again, when Davey gets to start... Again, you want to talk about like kids' fantasies. When you're nine years old, the opportunity to drive yep. is actually one of them. And <laughs> that he would not just drive, but have to evade bad guys like <laughs> he's Indiana Jones or you know the Luke Skywalker or anyone. Is Rosovich reading a Sports Illustrated with the Dallas Cowboys article? He absolutely is. <laughs> nice touch. Again, why is he leaving the keys? Probably because not he's the not brains the... of the operation. Exactly. My dad had an Oldsmobile with that exact same color of inter- interior. Burgundy interior. <laughs> Could you escape the trunk by doing this to the... I don't think I mean, so. I never tried. I mean, obviously, a lot of cars, you can do this now, but I mean, he just busts this seat here. Yeah. That's, that's not supposed to do that. Well, maybe Jack helped him. That would be cheating. An early appearance of a cell phone? 
Well, mm-hmm. back then they called them car phones. Car phones. Yep. <laughs> I think a lot of people would remember her from the Twilight Zone movie. Um, yes. George Miller directed, uh, what's the name of it? Nightmare at 25,000 feet or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The annoying child on the plane constantly giving John Lithgow grief. Mm hmm. She can, I mean, she continued acting over the years. She's not, I uh, think she's retired now, but she was on a, there was a show called Out of This World. Yeah. Uh, which is a weird show about a, a teenage girl finds out that her parents or her dad was an alien. Her oh, that's weird. Played, yeah. Played I, by Burt Reynolds. I vaguely remember this. Yeah. 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 She, she wasn't the, 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 she was like the friend of the teenager mm. uh, who was played by Maureen Flanagan. Get some, get a little exposition dump here. This guy is about to blow up a nine, ten year old little girl, and the whole neighborhood, a, apparently, according to yeah, him. with enough <laughs> plastique to just, I mean, seriously. I mean that would that would mean the whole complex is going to go if she's at home. You know, it's yes. like, jeez. So now we're okay. So we're at eleven oh one p.m. here. Now this is obviously okay, this movie yeah. speeds up a bit. It just, you have to forgive that. Just, you have well, you have to forgive a lot of it, but it just every once in a while you have to go like they just gave it like ten more minutes. <laughs> you can probably pull it off with a little more. You know, Al- Alvarez is not great at keeping an eye on children either. Nope. Like one of them could have gone to get rice, and one of them could have stayed with the car, but that's okay. This all worked out. Again, this is great. You're, again, you're nine, ten years old watching this movie. And he's going to escape in this car. <laughs> it's just, it's fantastic. This I was the, the, obviously the same summer that Short Round was driving a car sure. for Indiana Jones, too. Mm-hmm. So it was a good summer for children and vehicles. Yeah, I must have seen this around the same time I saw the Goonies in, in the theater. You know, it was probably because I don't think I saw this in 84, but definitely around 85 where I was like, oh, my God, I can go on all these adventures. <laughs> like, I mean, consider the, the the period from like 1982 to like 86, if you will. And 84 was a big year for it that obviously the, the video game thing was becoming an influence in movies because you had Tron and War Games the previous years. But 84 was a, was a year where it really started to explode with, like you sort of mentioned, the the child adventures or the teenage adventure films where you had yeah. Gremlins, Last Starfighter, Red Dawn, even mm-hmm. never ending story. This, the Goonies, Explorers, Daryl, uh, yep. back to the future, young Sherlock Holmes, the science craze where you know, speaking about movies that open on the same day, real genius and my science project. You got open it. on the same day. Mm-hmm. Uh, Space camp, even the sure. boy who could fly Manhattan project, solar babies, <laughs> you know, so I just threw Solar Babies in there. You have to, of course you yeah. do. Yeah, um, that was. I think Solar Babies was the end of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. It killed um, it. <laughs> right. Just um, like ET, the video game killed Atari. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, summer of '86, you know, Flight of the Navigator, uh, Invaders mm-hmm. from Mars. That was Kobe another Hoover. one. Yeah, that was another one yeah. I watched a lot. Mm-hmm. Flight of the Navigator. Oh, that's such a good shot. Just yeah. a car flying out there. So much fun. I do want to mention this too. That it, it's funny that if have you ever seen there's you know you mentioned the window earlier, which is an earlier iterate, iteration of the story that this is based on. But uh, have you ever seen the 1946 version of Cloak and Dagger? It's not Fritz Lang, is it? Yes, it's oh. a Fritz Lang film. Uh, and I uh, must have at the, some point. I just don't remember. Has, obviously, it has nothing to do with this movie, but. When you see that movie, uh, it's clearly the inspiration for the film that I saw in the summer of 1984 after getting sold out of The Last Starfighter for a second time. Oh, wild. Yeah, and that movie was top secret. (laughs) If you watch the 1946 Cloak and Dagger, it is clearly a direct inspiration for the plot of Top Secret. I never connected those two, and now I'm going to. Yeah, you watch it, and particularly the ending with the 
the plane. Mm. Them waiting to take off in the plane at the end. Man, it's just all connected, isn't it? It's so weird mm-hmm. how that happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely wanted my parents to get me some walkie-talkies after seeing this movie. You never had any walkie-talkies, even like cheap ones? I think, yeah, no, I think I got some eventually. I don't know if it was yeah. soon after this or if it was a birthday present or not. I know I owned them. They never weren't had good. Them. Yeah, never had that style. I had the ones no. that, like, you know, maybe you could, like, front yard to backyard, maybe you could pick up a signal. Yes, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. When you're playing hide-and-seek with the walkie-talkies. Bad guys are always driving a van. I wonder where the yeah. origins of that came from. I mean, I guess it probably just happens. <laughs> and just happen to traveling with hardware that fits into a case. Mm-hmm. You know, give me the case. Just in case I needed this giant machine gun this day. Yeah. Oh, he said the title of the movie. Take a drink. There it is. Yeah, I kind of remember that this scene in particular from the trailer. I might have seen the trailer before Mm -hmm. the movie, and I just remember anticipating what's going to happen in the phone booth here because I think they show what happens pretty much. They do. Right. Yeah, the, this uh, this particular moment and the reveal of the bomber on the computer screen were two things that I remember explicitly from the trailer. And Davey coming out uh, saying that you know, they just killed a man, now they're after me. Right. Mm-hmm. But it didn't matter. I mean, Henry Thomas could have just been walking around talking. It was just the, the, the fact that it was the star of E.T. was in a new movie. I had to see it. Of course. Again, here's great reveal. There's the van yep. in the background. With those headlights, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This guy's about to get Keith Gordon. Yep. He probably should have known that something was going to happen if after he hits yeah. the phone booth. He probably could have done this a, with a little more tact, but uh, hey. Yeah. He was driving, and well, if he wasn't driving and holding the gun, you know. Yeah. That's why you don't. You shouldn't multitask while you're driving. Mm-hmm. Good lesson. Lessons to be learned. See now, if you were ten years old and you're in this situation, you would probably grab the gun, would you not? I mean, it wouldn't be. You know, we don't want children playing with guns, obviously. But if you're in your brain, you're in this situation. You might need something to protect yourself. I would, in hopes of not having to use it. But, yeah, (laughs) I would. Very Davy Osborne of you. Um, (laughs) Well, yeah, that's that's the other thing, too. I mean, that's... It's pretty... It's pretty incredible that 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 what happens, which we're going to get to very soon, happens Mm -hmm. to to Davy, because... Yeah. Oof. And he's able to drink espresso. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, in Davy's mind, yeah. he is. That's the first time we've seen him without his hat, too, right? With his uh, little beret. I, I think I, so. Yeah, I think so, too. The only three people out in San Antonio past 11 o'clock. Apparently. Yeah. All right, it's time. Give me the case. <laughs> <laughs> Smashes over the coffee. He hates coffee. Uh, that's right. Yeah. God, that's some heavy-duty artillery right there. To kill a child with. Right? Mm-hmm. Oh, but it does have a silencer, so it won't be that loud. I mean, you want to talk, again, you want to talk about origin stories. This guy, you know, the, the, the this espionage stuff is his side deal, basically. He, the guy does work at Textronics, which is a game company. So, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, what does he need? He's only doing, a, you know, a little side espionage, basically. Why does he need this hardware? Even, I mean, this, you, didn't, you didn't see Sean Penn and Timothy Hutton running around with this stuff in Falcon and the Snowman. Right. I guess he just thinks he needs it for protection. I guess. That's, it is Texas. I mean, we got yeah. to keep forgetting that <laughs> part. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, man. This is, I mean, that's a nasty bruise for a fall like that, too. Yeah. Yeah, this whole transition of for Davy's character is just, yeah, again, it, it, it kind of breaks my heart. Like back back when I was younger, I was like, oh, cool, he gets to you know shoot the bad guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. But now I'm like, oh my gosh, poor kid, you know. Well, it's I mean, it's again, it, it is designed as sort of a hero moment. But right. The, yeah. the, the great the, the great thing about Holland's screenplay, well, uh, you know, anyone criticizing it, that to have Davy. Be reluctant to do any of this stuff. That is, as a as a movie goer, you're you're kind of frustrated that no, no, pick up the gun because that's what you want any character to do when you're they're in danger. But his reluctance to do any of this stuff and is being egged on by this alter ego. It's I mean it's a thing that gives you a little bit of hope for Davy as a human being. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Tom Holland also did an interesting movie called, or he wrote a movie called Scream for Help, which mm-hmm. was came out the same year. And again, another story about a teenager who's convinced that her stepfather is trying to murder her and her mother. Uh, so yeah, he, kind he of, has a type. Yeah, yeah, for I mean, sure. Child's Play you can throw onto that list as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, yeah, definitely. And uh, Richard Franklin, which I believe um, back when changed hosts for a while, Brad and Al covered Richard Franklin on a very early episode when they first started. Uh, mainly sung the praises and focused on uh, road games, of course, which, mm-hmm. again, another tie-in to the world of Psycho by casting Jamie Lee Curtis in the, in the lead. And here, uh, no, I think actually for Psycho 2, they wanted to have Jamie Lee Curtis in the Meg Tilly role. Which mm. I, I actually didn't know until recently, uh, and I I also uncovered the fact that Richard Franklin didn't want to cast Dabney Coleman. He wanted Kevin Klein. Can you mm. imagine Kevin Klein in this role? I mean, obviously, I think Dabney Coleman is pitch perfect. I, I think you actually absolutely could imagine Kevin Klein in this role. Yeah, yeah, I think I could I, too. Yeah, and again, nothing not taking anything away from Dabney Coleman, but Kevin Klein would have been great. Yeah, in this role. Poor mouse. Aww. Yeah, I know. I know this. This is a, such a great moment. <laughs> I mean, just in just in just film in general, but consider how dangerous this is. Right. Draw his fire. <laughs> this is. I mean, this is amazing. I. Oh. Yep. Like I. I, I remember losing my mind at the sleepover watching this. I'm like, this is fantastic. And you can tell he's traumatized, you know, and he doesn't want oh, to do yes. this. Oh, yes! You know. Yep. Did you think that, though, when you saw this the first time, though? You you wanted him to pick up that gun. Of course. No, that's yeah. true. Yeah, now it's... Yeah, he's going to, going to have to keep that doctor's appointment. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I ventured this far into the uh, Riverwalk tour, but now I, now I wish I had. Just like, you, where's the cloak and really dagger tour? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Because if this people... movie were more successful, that there probably would be a cloak and dagger tour. I mean, Goonies yeah. has uh, tours, or at least did. They shut down the, the house tour that they were used to do with the house. Uh, I, this is this uh, is some of the most evil stuff. I cannot get over his dialogue in this scene. I really yeah. can't. And, and, and even back then as a kid, I'm just like, oh my god. Yeah. He's going to fresh clip this kid. And again, okay. Modern day audiences watching this is... This is definitely triggering. For certain. And mm-hmm. let it be known that if you do not want to watch a scene like this, it's completely understandable. Hearing... Murphy's dialogue here is not is something unfortunately that we've heard way too many times on the news. Yeah, I know. 
shredded meat as something that we've heard what has happened to bodies of children and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But in the context of the fantasy of this movie, I mean, that, oh my god. Yeah, the idea of that alone is just horrifying. Yeah, this is a very Fight Club kind of moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, where it's just like, I want to do something, and this other side of me is telling me to do something, but I don't want to be that person, so I'm not going mm-hmm. to. There's a real internal conflict going on here that is really profound. Yeah, and I remember that line, the way Murphy delivers that line, I want to shoot I you. Mean, yeah, he just <laughs> he's so happy. This is like bucket list for him. Yeah. And again, also very clever that we're watching him watch the mysterious, you know, the the invisible Jack Flack, and he's wondering who's over there. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he probably thinks somebody else is there, and that's why he's shooting it. But again, if I was in the theater, I would have applauded that. Yeah, no, of course. But in the reality, uh, a, a little boy just killed somebody. You know, and, the, and again, Franklin and Holland screenplay smartly plays this out here that that yeah. is exactly what happened. That this child just had to shoot a guy that he was going to shoot his kneecaps off. Yeah, and and again, with what happens to Jack, a nice sort of you know representation of lost innocence here. You know, like the fact that he, Davy's never going to be the same after this, without a doubt. You know, he's not going to be, he's just basically becoming an adult, <laughs> you know, yeah. mm-hmm. by doing something like that and making that decision and having to live with it. And certainly he realizes the gravity of this whole situation and, you know, what he's done. But he will not, be fine because he has his dad. Yeah. Or does he? We'll get, we'll get, to, that. <laughs> uh, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. I don't know, but even as a kid, I was really like. I don't know. Um, emotional over what happens next. Well, this is. I think that this actually belongs on that short list of like traumatic movie mo- movie moments from the nineteen eighties, like E. T. Mm. going home, oh, a yeah. oh. horse, a never ending story. Yeah, and this. I mean, the way that this plays out, and this is another great bit of the screenplay too, where he references his dad did the same thing that his dad grew up to a point where he didn't want to play anymore with his toys. It's This is before Toy Story 3. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and, no, totally. And that's, I mean, and seeing, like, all the blood leak out of him in that shot, it's just, you see it, and it's like, oh my god. No, that's a great correlation, because, uh, again, like, it's a Pixar sentiment, like, a Pixar-like sentiment, what's going on with this scene. And... Mm-hmm. I think that's why, like, oh, yeah, Pixar is guaranteed to make you cry. Um, if we weren't talking over this scene like we're supposed to, uh, I would be I would be pretty emotional. And I, I, I guess, again, that stems back to my relationship with my dad, too. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's just... But even as a kid, I just remember going, oh, no, I don't want Jack Flack to die, you know, right. because that means he's losing this part of himself in a way, you know, this this... This younger self, this, uh, m- you know, more uh, imaginative, yeah. creative mm-hmm. person. You know, it's like, oh, now I have to grow up and become something else now. I can't rely on this figment of my imagination anymore. Right. Oh, and of course he's crying, so that's, yeah. He's such a good actor. Henry Thomas, man, good lord. And he's doing yeah. great work these days with, um, with Mike Flanagan. Yes, he is. He really is, yeah. Midnight Mass, Haunting of Hill House. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad he's still uh, working. Doctor Sleep, even. Yep. That's a great. That's a great line too, where he says, "Where Jack Flack says, I always hate that. Hated that rule. Leaving when they stopped believing.' Right. And Davy's on his own now. Yeah. Again, like the the time, the ticking clock here. I'm like, come on, kid. You got, and I'm glad he looks at his watch and realizes it. But oh man, yeah, 
I think if we actually did this in real time, it wouldn't play out. But Any, you know, anyone okay. who's ever made a trip to the airport knows you're not getting there in 18 no, minutes. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, pre-9-11, but still, yeah. uh, you know, back then... Oh my God! And yeah, and the the lack of security, or at least the <laughs> right how things are in terms of like kids just running around, getting <laughs> to the plane. Yeah, even even if you grant the movie its geography that San Antonio might be you know fifteen minutes from everywhere. Apparently, uh, the, it, yeah, <laughs> it's just even if you granted that the yeah, it just like just give it a few more minutes, guys. You could have just another ten minutes here, another five minutes there, and you probably could have pulled off the ticking clock. You know, it, it's but it still works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to get to the airport in time with what they're doing, and they have to be on hold waiting for the de- the detective. Mm-hmm. And yeah. <laughs> well, also the fact that that Davy has managed to get from the closed part of the downtown river walk to apparently the shadiest part of San Antonio in the next mm-hmm. scene. And you can tell it's shady because of the music that they're playing. Exactly. There's something, there's something off here and the cab drivers don't have sleeves. Right. Of course the cab driver who, well, again, he lost his butt. He's going to lost his bus pass. He lost the one piece of currency he owned in his life. I bet the creators of Quick Change were a big fan of this sequence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always, I always hated this guy that he wouldn't let him. You know, I under, I understand it, but you know. Yep. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I would obviously. <laughs> yeah. And it was an express bus too. Would have got him right there. Ugh. I wonder what Kim expected to do when if she confronted the the yeah, old elderly the couple. Shady part. Gee, I, I wonder who that is. Driver is. Yeah, in his first role, possibly, if I'm not mistaken, I, earliest I role. Think so. Yep. The late, the late great, great yep. Louis Anderson. Indeed. One of the hits his cab here. Jerk. <laughs> and then he finds the nicest cab driver. Yep. Meanwhile, Davy's leg is bleeding out. Right. <laughs> he yeah, he cares. You can tell he really cares about him. He wants to take him to the hospital. How bad, <laughs> so, how, how bad did his leg have to look for him to suggest you should a get hospital. to a hospital? Yeah. About ten minutes. Yeah, and what did the clock just say recently? Eleven forty-five. Even as someone who l- used to live about fifteen minutes away from O'Hare, it would never take you eighteen minutes. No. Just because once you once you reach the, I mean, again, this is, I mean, this is Texas. I mean, you hit that traffic and trying just trying to drop someone off at the airport you know mm. that that bomb's going off i guess i don't need that gun anymore everything is fine I, <laughs> it's just again it's you know they they, they you got to solve problems when you're a screenwriter sometimes and apparently he needed that gun to get to the airport and And, the, and these days, this wouldn't fly. You'd just be like, can you please search my bag, please? I don't want to put it through that thing. Right. Yeah. Boy, these what, cops, these cops don't care. No. Well, this this one cop here, I'm pretty sure, is needs to take a crap in a little while. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Look what time it is, by the way. That bomb is going off in six minutes. Right. There's a there's a great we we missed it a little bit earlier, but when he's she's trying to get the other cop to take her seriously, you actually like you keep seeing people bump into the walkie talkie in her backpack. <laughs> it's just like you think like there's the slightest thing might set that bomb off in her walkie talkie. Yeah, oh, the you got a, you got a yeah. game that doesn't exist. Okay, mm-hmm. no problem. That should have been the first clue that something was wrong. Yeah.
<laughs> don't they? Uh, yeah, they should be responding to that ticking sound. Don't they? they they've seen movies. I'm sure these cops have mm-hmm. seen movies. What's that could the, have been the guy's watch. Yeah. Well, I guess so. I guess that could have been it. Yeah. Again, another moment of solving a problem here. Mm-hmm. Fast thinking. Really ingenious. Yep. Yep. And see, David called it a cartridge there. Yep. Wonderful. He does call it secret cartridge, I think, earlier in the film, too. In mm-hmm. that tape, yeah. But I think the cop should have realized this sooner. That, yeah, yeah I don't think they're actually his parents, but okay. You think, why did it take these two so long to get to the airport, too? Mm. They, they, they already they already chloroformed the kid. They had plenty of time. Why why did it take them five minutes before boarding to get to this airport? Because even back then, I'm sure people were encouraged to get there at least a half hour, if not more, at, sooner. At the very least. Yeah. I mean, nowadays, it's like, get there two hours if you can. <laughs> I mean, give yourself plenty of time, because mm-hmm. you just never know what can go wrong. Yeah, Jack, this is- John McIntyre bought on... Just about to go full freak out in the last 15 minutes of this movie. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and, I like that guy great. in the background going, he grabbed a gun! <laughs> That's <Yeah>. really cheesy. <laughs> the guy on the right, he's just, you watch him coming up. He's hes not interested in Davy. He needs to get to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. I bet. You'll see. Okay. Yeah, I'd be hurrying a little bit faster. Oh, oh, you got to meet up with uh, the lieutenant. Okay. Good timing there. Everyone yep. showed up at the exact same time. What does the clock say? 11.57. Three minutes. This poor guy's walking into a bullet here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And he's just like curled up in the fetal position for the whole mm-hmm. time oh, after my this. Leg. Yep. There he is. Not holding the wound, just mm-hmm. in a fetal position. Ah. Find the plot there. Of mm-hmm. course. There it is. Even the cop called it a cartridge. Forget the luggage. Let's get out of here. The guy in the background. <laughs> yep. Again, unfortunately, something probably hits a little too close to home for people these days. Mm-hmm. Some more ADR work there. Okay, watch the first guy through the thing here. This guy's got to go to the bathroom. He's holding on to his yeah, belt yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I now can watch see that. When, And you're going to watch him. He just takes off here in a moment. Watch him mm. here. Oh. I'm... He's gone. He's gone. Okay. He needed to find a toilet. Well, he, he was drinking a lot of coffee there in the in the. I think That's that was true. the same cop. It was the same guy. Yeah. See, Tom Holland's always thinking. Richard Franklin on the ball. They they know their characters. Yeah, that cop behind there looks a little like James Tolkien. Like a younger James <laughs> Yeah, Tolkien, Just yeah. a little bit. Well, you had three minutes a couple minutes ago. <laughs> yep. Now this is where the dad becomes a true blue hero, man. Mm-hmm. With what he does. Again, also just a, a genius bit of the script. He's already wearing a... Yeah. Air, you know, the uniform. And of course, what else do you need when you're a pilot? A hat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, are these three guys the act should have been like the the actual pilots, and they're just like, I'm not going out there. Yeah. I, yeah, I wonder about that actually. Yeah, where, what happened to the real pilot? He just left. Another wonderful moment there. Remember your blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord, I would have had a heart attack like. An hour ago. See, then they still have three minutes. (laughs) 
Now, just for future reference here, if you if you buy it from the minute countdown, mm. then the plane should explode when he locks the door to the cockpit. If you're actually doing a countdown. Okay. Even even with the momentary pause, not this one. There's a second moment momentary pause. Yeah. Yeah, they probably should have added some more time mm-hmm. to make it a little more believable. But hey, again, it's a did this all really happen? Hmm. I don't know. Right. Maybe this is from a kid's perspective. You never know. I mean, that's a th- I mean, it, we're still not in the Fight Club Mulholland Drive era of cinema, the Sixth Sense and whatnot, mm-hmm. where everything, where yet we have to take with a grain of salt kind of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, and even people who make have fan theories about those movies and whatnot, it, it just basically kind of comes down to like, well, it doesn't matter. It's just what I think. So, <laughs> so you can apply anything you want and if you want to think that this is all part of davy's imagination sure i mean you could make those connections oh he should have woke up at the end of the movie be like oh i just had the weirdest dream (laughs) but but then it would be a brian de palma movie oh well i like femme fatale it's Uh uh-huh it's free yeah Yeah, another ingenious thing here that I didn't necessarily pick up on when I was a kid. Like, what's he doing? Oh, he's actually not radioing the tower. He's calling Mm -hmm. out to his son. Right. And I think even she has a look of confusion. Like, why is he broadcasting here? Yeah, why why do I hear this? Yeah. You have to admit, the old, old spies here not coming up with a good plan down the stretch. No. I don't know how they think they're going to get away with all of this. Yeah. And they, have they been like Russian spies like in the country for a long time and making their move now or <laughs> really smart, really mm-hmm. smart. Here we go. So cockpit door closing should be the bomb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the timing is way off, but oh well. The plane took off pretty quickly. <laughs> oh, man. That score, too, again. It just sounds like a ticking time bomb. Yep. Boom. Yep, you're right. I think a lot of people, well, now I don't know if everybody does, but some people definitely have the interpretation, the darker interpretation of this ending. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like, it's funny because uh, recently on Christmas movies, actually, uh, we all talked about the movie Prancer and how that movie ends. You can Hmm. either think of it as, did that deer just leap to his death, or is he really flying in the air? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, well, I know that the uh, director might have said, well, my yeah, it's up to you. You decide. It depends on how you feel. Well, this is to to further support the theory that it's all in Davy's imagination. I mean, at no point here does his dad even know that there's a bomb on the plane there's no point where he's made aware of that knowledge correct i don't think so he just knows that his boy has been kidnapped right davy was the only one that was even aware of the bomb yeah 
I remember Henry Thomas saying that like they actually did <laughs> create this explosion and it he actually felt it, which is pretty scary. Yeah. And again, is this Davy's imagination, this fantasy that he's played out to bring him closer to his father? Yeah, I wonder. And then you see the silhouette there where Jack Flack becomes his dad. You know, clearly yeah. it's all clearly it's green screen or back then probably blue screen but hey Mm -hmm. you know i buy the sentiment of this final moment absolutely 100 percent. so it doesn't matter i mean i i accept this as reality yeah i know it's ridiculous but it doesn't matter because that's the point of the movie yeah no exactly because i think even um holland himself said that he had had, you know rocky relationship with his own father and he's sort of wrote that into this movie to make it personal. Yeah. You know? And it plays into the idea of, the, you know, in, an, in the Indiana Jones era that we're in at this point, of serial cliffhangers and the, the thought that Jack Flack always escapes, that you would think that that person should have been blown up at the end of the last chapter, but they escape yeah. at the end. And so that completely makes sense. And when his dad says that to him, Jack Flack always escapes... You know, it, it's, it doesn't contradict the idea of the everyman as hero, but this is this moment for his son. No, that's so so true. And I'm sure the first thing that uh, Dad says to him is like, all right, we're going to get you to that doctor in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think they're both going to the doctor in the morning. Yeah, uh, that's a lot to take on. Oh, boy. But what a special film, really. And people, I mean, there's Louis Anderson... Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, I mean, this movie moves, Th- this sucker moves. It's only, like, I know it flies by long. every time I see it. I'm just it's, like, yeah, it, it's, it's over in a heartbeat. It really is. Yeah. It's a, it's amazing. I mean, even like the big reveal, I mean, we're just barely an hour into the movie when we get the big reveal of the glove and it's just, it's, it's full of action and ingenuity and it's fun. And yes, as 30 some year, almost 40 years later the idea of children and guns and death and that kind of stuff r- runs a completely different way and that's absolutely understandable but that has nothing to do with the movie's existence at the time that it did so let's not throw it under the bus for being a movie of its time and yeah i've, I've thankfully never been in a situation like that <laughs> but uh, in my in my mind, I have, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, in a movie like this, sometimes, you know, you you play it out in your in your head yourself. Like, what would you do in a situation like this? And oh, sure, yeah, mod- modern times, that's not really a question. There's there is almost no way out of that situation sometimes. And but this is but this movie whole movie is a fantasy. Yeah, in one way or the other, and that's the and that's the thing too. I think the reason why you know I went back to this movie a whole lot because it 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 really connects to that idea of escaping into a whole other world, a whole other universe that is still grounded in some kind of reality because it's San Antonio. It's not necessarily outer space, <laughs> yeah. you know. Like, and I think that appealed to me more than anything. I mean, obviously, all those wonderful movies where geez, even he meets an alien or whatever, it, it still has a special place in my heart now more than it even did back then. But uh, yeah, this one really, really holds up beautifully. And, and, you know, another great father and son movie, you know? Yeah. And I guess it was just, I mean, it was just such a loaded summer. So we talked about a few of those titles. I mean, this movie, you know, it was finished 82nd at the box office in 1984. Uh, Universal had an 80th and 81st place where DC cab and terror in the aisles. Oh, made, mm. made more money than cloak and dagger. Oh, wow. And, mm. and this also, I mean, you know, talk about great days and movies. This movie opened the same day as red dawn, which was actually a big hit yeah. uh, late that summer and the adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That was all, August all the 10th, movies that we grew up loving as kids. <laughs> On cable, for the yeah. most part. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, and I, 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 I think they tried to... Did they release this separately? It wasn't just the double feature, right, with Last Starfighter. I think they released it yeah, later last, in the last year. Starfighter, yeah, Last Starfighter came out a month earlier, and then this came out on August 10th with those movies. 
Mm. Yeah. But it's so good. It is. It's it's wonderful. And you got to give you got to give credit to Tom Holland who of course like I said, you know, would go on to do something incredibly original and memorable in its own right with Fright Night. Uh and yeah, I just I, I every time I go back to this, I just I sort of feel more than just the nostalgia quotient. You know, I think I feel uh, a sense of connection to this movie in a way that I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm glad mm-hmm. it exists. I'm glad that vinegar syndrome put out that package recently. I haven't, I didn't dive into all the extras yet. I'm very curious to hear the, um, the commentary with another filmmaker and podcaster. Uh, I believe Joe Lynch is doing the the commentary mm-hmm. with, um, with Holland who is, yep. uh, who is still with us. And I think he is, uh, but Richard Franklin is not. Um, but mm-hmm. no, yeah, this was, like I said, I think I watched this and Daryl and war games and the Goonies and all sorts of things over and over and over again to where it's, yeah, it's, it's always gonna, it's always gonna hold up for me personally. I mean, I, right. I, I, I understand why people get critical about certain things, but it's just not going to happen for some, for some movies of this era. No, for me. So nope, me neither. And I'm so glad you were able to come on and talk about it with me. It was such a blast watching this with you. You know, I mean, yeah, it, it does. It does take me back, like doing these commentaries. It does take me back to those times, even though we probably talked way less. But getting to hang out with your friends, you know, mm-hmm. and just watch a movie mm-hmm. together, and maybe have uh, occasional comments throughout, like, "Oh, that's the guy from this movie," you know, and that sort of thing. But no, I mean. I'm so glad that this movie has gotten the release it deserves too. So right. people can go back to it and maybe even enjoy what we had to say about it. And I hope everybody enjoyed what we did have to say about it. I hope so too. Yeah. We'll have to do this again. Maybe another movie from this era. Who knows? <laughs> it's a we'll good see. summer. It sure was. It sure was. Um, so yeah, just a plug away where everybody can find you, Eric. Uh, you can find me, uh, the Movie Madness Podcast, on nowplaynetwork.net uh, that uh, do movie reviews and DVDs and Blu-rays talk. And uh, also the the Friendship Dilemma, which we started this year, which I do with uh, Morgan Geyer. Uh, we've got a number of episodes up right now. We'll be doing some more very shortly. Oh, that'd be wonderful. You should probably do Cloak and Dagger. There's a, there's a little friendship I, there. I <laughs> have thought about that. It, it has come up. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, and certainly my the, the premise of that podcast is male and female friendships in movies and the yes. lack thereof. Mm-hmm. No, it's great. I really, really enjoy it. Thank you. And all the things that you do, including you're hosting a screening of the Goonies. I think that's gonna be in a week, right? I think July sixth. Yeah. So if you're in town in Oak Grove, I will be doing a July sixth, twenty twenty two commentary for uh, not commentary, but Q and A for the for the Goonies live screening of it. Oh uh, yes, I, I definitely have vivid memories of seeing that on the big screen for sure, and that's a special, a special movie that yep, a lot of people have turned on, and I'm sure you'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, and we're hoping in again, depending on when people hear this, in September 2022, at the first Wednesday of every month, we do the Critics Classic series at Oak Grove Cinema, and it's if, if things play out, we're hoping it will work out. On uh, September, the first Wednesday of September, uh, we're going to be doing a League of Their Own, and oh. you might get a live edition of The Friendship Dilemma at that screening. Well, geez, I'm definitely going to come out It might be myself and Morgan. Yeah. yeah. If it, we're hoping it was going to work out. Uh, if, if, if it does work out, it'll be myself and Morgan doing a Q&A afterwards. Uh, so hopefully that will happen. And you'll definitely be back on the show at the very least for when we cover 1993 next year. Oh, oh boy. What a year. That nine hour show that's going to be. Yeah. It's only getting longer and longer every yep. year. So uh, I'm expecting that and I couldn't be more excited and hopefully we'll get to do that in person. Uh, you know, we'll see hopefully because mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it even is more fun when you can do that. But uh no, I'm again, thank you for being on and everybody can please visit directorsclubpodcast.com 
And uh, yeah, if you want to support the show and the network, go over to patreon.com slash directors club and just yeah, throw a few bucks my way if you feel inclined to do so. And of course, uh, the Keith Gordon episode will be posted probably in time for the 4th of July holiday. Fingers crossed. I cannot wait for that conversation because we're talking about underrated or underseen or at this point, favorite films of the 1960s because mm. a, a lot of the titles we're covering, I would probably put in at least my top 50 of all time so there's there's we're gonna have some great conversations and yay keith gordon came up in this conversation so again it all <laughs> it all comes together wonderfully that's right all right thanks so much eric we'll be in touch take care my pleasure thank you yeah. always escapes. I don't need him anymore. I've got you, Dad. 